Good morning. Piety in prosperity. Huh, that's a snap, right? Piety in prosperity. We've been talking about Job. Some of you are visiting this morning. We've been talking about Job, and we've been doing it a couple of weeks already. Um, 42 chapters. We're moving very slowly. Um, but, but we have looked at that part. Uh, we know the description. We know what was said about him. We know what he said about God. We know, we know how he was living. We know about those first four things that were said about him in the very first verse. And, and that whole first part of the first chapter is a godly man living in prosperity. Sounds good. It isn't, but it sounds good. It's hard to live with money. It really is difficult. And the Proverbs speak about that. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. And there's a high wall in his own imagination. <laughs> sure, he says, I've got money in the bank. I can handle that. I have 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. I don't know what I'm going to do with all those. But I've got... Look, it's possible to be very, very wealthy and not be very, very godly. God isn't opposed to wealth. That isn't the point. It's just that wealth tends to make you feel, ah, I've got it. I can take care of that. The verse right before the one I just read you in Proverbs is that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and is safe. That's where the safety is. But the first part of Job is, Job was a righteous, straight, blameless, and a fearer of God who turned away from evil. Man, he was pious in prosperity. And I'm looking at the way, in our study of this book of Job, this first part, the prologue, we haven't been going through it as a narrative. We've been going through it looking at certain theological and important biblical aspects, how they look at how those characters in the first section of the book look at God and what they know about Him. And uh, mostly we have seen what the book, the author, what God, because this is a book that He has had written by inspiration, and what Job think about God. Very important. Today it's a little different. Today we're anticipating the piety in adversity. Anticipating. We may not get all the way through this. Being godly, being godly is great when everything is going well and we can say, thank you, Lord, this is what you've given me. And you've already commented on the fact that Job said, thank you, Lord, this is what you've taken from me. Now we're going to deal with something of that process. But there are three things we must review. <laughs> Sorry about that. Before we deal with this portion, that's why we may not get through this this morning. There are three areas we have to review. Make sure we know them. The first is the area that there is such a thing as angels. An angel. There are angels one of whom was Satan. They exist. They don't live here. The Scriptures say they live in the heavenlies. We understand that they're because of what Paul told us, too, that there is a third heaven. And that's caught up to the presence of God. And there's an atmosphere above us, but apparently there are heavenlies in between. And it appears that the Scriptures refer to the hosts of heaven and refer to two things. That area between atmosphere and mm, the presence of God. Stars, 
and angels. I recommend you look at a concordance sometime and check that out. The hosts, the host of heaven. Apparently, that's the area that has been assigned as an abode for angels. Not that they don't go into the presence of God. We're going to see that this morning. But that apparently is the abode. They do not live here. They come here. They have come here. But they exist. And your opinion or my opinion about whether they exist does not change the fact that the Scriptures say they do exist. Okay, we take it then. That angels exist. Second observation. Satan was an angel. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. Those are the passages one should read. We're not going to take the time to do that this morning. But one considers, one considers the, the character of that angel before he fell. The other tells us what he did in the fall. And the character of that angel before he fell, he was a cherub. Cherubim is plural. Hebrew words that end in I am mean more than one. But he was a cherub. And, and from, we, can, we can deduce, as we look through the Scripture, the fact that a cherub was intimately associated with the throne, the, the righteousness, the holiness of God. There was a cherub before the, the gate to the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword, not allowing them to go back into the garden. There are cherubim in the, in the embroideries in the, in the tabernacle, and, and there were two cherubim on hovering, hovering over the Ark of the Covenant. Those, those are areas which, which are symbolizing the holiness and, and presence of God. Cherubim protected the throne. God didn't need protection. It wasn't that. But it was assigned to them in His program, and that's apparently what they were doing. Lucifer, Satan before he fell, was a cherub. And, and, and the passage tells us that he was glorious in his appearance and, and until sin was uncovered in him. That's the word it uses. Uncovered in him. To deny angels, to deny the, per- the existence of angels, to deny... The Satan, the existence of Satan, to deny the devil is to reproach the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He testified to the existence of Satan. And angels were not an illusion. Angels who came down in the Old Testament, we're not in an illusion. Several of them ate with Abraham. Angels, uh, illusions don't do that. Uh, there was an angel who passed around uh, in, in, in the, uh, the children of Israel, uh, the nation of Israel, after David's sin of numbering the people. And, and that angel instituted a plague and killed people. Illusions don't do that. No, they were real. And the Lord Jesus Christ testified to the fact that uh, Satan was real. And in his very birth, remember the hosts that were in the heavens declaring the glory of God. No. No. These were real. And the Scriptures testify to that. And the only authoritative source we have for information about angels... Or Satan is found in the Word. In any other source. We sometimes read an article that states that something happened in such a way and then that man did never, you never saw him again and must have been an angel. Hmm, maybe so. And I know it does say that we might entertain angels unaware. I have often had to write thank you letters for having been in, entertained in a home, but I warn them that they get no uh, star in their crown because I'm not an angel. These are real. When we come to this portion in Job, we are not dealing with an illusion. We're dealing with a real individual created by God Himself. Angels were created. Satan among them created. 
he fell when that evil was uncovered in him. Something else we have to uh, review. And this is probably more important than the fact that Satan exists or that angels exist. The God of this book. And it's extremely important that we be with this this morning. Who is he? He's the just God. Immutably just. Means always. He never does anything out of character. He's just. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18.25 Of course. Remember what we have commented on a couple of other occasions. All of God, everything that God does is done by all of what He is. And He's not uh, the sum total of parts. He has no parts. This is His character. He's just. And He's always just. And He's good. Immutably good. He never changes. He's always good. He never does anything without demonstrating that He's good. We're taking it from Job. I mean, we're talking about Job this morning. But it certainly applies to what's been happening in our uh, newspapers. He's good. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endures forever. He's wise. Immutably wise. Never unwise. Always wise. Never vacillates. Never does anything without demonstrating His wisdom. He has eternal plans. Perfect plans and the best means to attain them. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the honor, glory, forever and ever. We've already commented on the fact that He's in control. This is a sovereign. Immutably so. Nothing is ever out of His control. Nothing is ever an obstacle to His pursuing His plan. These are the kinds of things we must stand on. If you filed that information, pull out the file folder. I hope you haven't. I, I, I hope that becomes part of the warp and woof of our walk, of, of, of the cloth of our lives. Immutably sovereign. Remember the former things of old. For I'm God. There's none else. I'm God. And there's none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will do my pleasure. I have spoken it. I'll bring it to pass. I've purposed it. I'll also do it. No accident. Purposeful things. It's God who works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and His Christ for of a truth against the whole, thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered for to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. But by a wise, good, just, God. 
Do I understand all of that and how it... No, I do not. Do I accept it? Yes, I do. The Bible has said so. It's the kind of medicine you don't leave in the cabinet, please. Medicine doesn't do any good in the medicine cabinet. You take it out and you rub it on the sore. And that's the God in the portion of Scripture that we read this morning. Good, wise, just, sovereign with a plan who is pursuing that plan. How many times have we talked about that very point right here? Very important. We get those background truths. There are angels. They exist. Satan does exist. I, 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 I'm embarrassed to be saying this in the same breath. The God we worship exists. And He is in those characteristics that we describe. Yeah, Satan's names kind of pretty well indicate the kind of guy he is. The deceiver, the accuser, um, they're not good. The adversary, the evil one. I understand there are about 40 different appellations, descriptions of, of uh, some of them as names, some of them as just descriptive, uh, descriptive of Satan throughout the Scripture. But we have to deal with the passage, especially looking at the time. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Well, what do you think about that? There was a day. There was a time. There was an appointed time. There was a specific time. There was a requirement. That's what's illustrated here. That's what's being, being brought out. These angels, including Satan, are not independent in the sense that have no responsibility to, no relationship to God. This day was an appointed day. How often did that occur? I don't know. It doesn't say. But it did occur. There was a responsibility, and Satan among them, responsible. Now, you must remember something else about Satan. He is not excluded from this kind of an interview because he has not been expelled and confined to the earth. Much less is he in hell. That's the popular depiction of a of a flaming place where where red horns and and tail. He's down there. No, not there yet, and not expelled from heaven. It will happen. It happens in Revelation twelve. It happens in the middle of the tribulation when he's cast out of heaven and he's confined to the earth. And then, no wonder there will be problems in tribulation times. But he has access. That's the key word. Access. And you will remember that he is the accuser of the brethren. Meaning that part of his job, according to him, is before God to accuse believers. That's with whom we're dealing. And he was called to be responsible. Access, but responsible. There was a day... And they came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan among them. By the way, that word Satan appears in, in the original languages with an article. And is not meant to say the um, evil personification. It, 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 it's an article. It identifies an individual. The Satan came. And the Lord said to Satan... Now, here's where people trip. The Lord said to Satan, 
where you come from. And the idea is here with many people, oh, now the Lord is instigating a terrible, terrible thing, and he's inviting Job, really, through Satan to sin. But let's look at that more carefully. The Lord did instigate the questioning of Satan. Where do you come from? And Satan said, now I'm reading King James, you know that. It's Yours may say something different, they sometimes do, but... From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Now, in a sense, that sounds a little bit innocent. Where you come from? Oh, I've just been touring around. You know, I've been around. The, the Hebrew word that's used here is much more significant than that. The Hebrew word is that um, I have been giving a careful and discriminating and peering into walk around the world. Around it. This was not just some casual uh, afternoon stroll. This was a purposeful, considerate, penetrating kind of look, peering into things. Why did God have to? To ask that question. Didn't he know? Why, of course he knew. We are talking about an omniscient God. We're not talking about someone who needed to have facts and information added to his store of knowledge. No, he knew. But God was designing something to bring out and to demonstrate. Even to those other angels. Remember, the angels are not omniscient. The angels aren't demiurgs and little gods with a little bit of everything he has. They don't know it all. And and God is asking this question, as the Lord Jesus did too in many occasions, ask questions to bring material, bring out to the fore this information. He knew very well where Satan was. And he knew very well the kind of walk that he had. Just as Peter wrote and said he's walking around as a lion seeking whom he may devour. That's the kind of walk. I've been just walking around doing this peering and inquiry and and, and, uh, intentionally doing this. And the Lord said to Satan, I have my my this version has the word considered. What do you have in in that other version? I don't remember. We didn't put it on the screen. You may not. Do you have the word consider? Ah, that's a good good word. Have you considered my servant Job? And the word consider is a translation of word that means have you set your heart on because you've seen what he really is. Have you set your heart on him? God knew very well that he had. This passage, as you have read it, it doesn't present before Satan somebody Satan didn't know anything about. He already knew. And and God asks him these questions to bring out. Yes, that's what he had done. He'd had his um, fiendish, I'll add the word, uh, his fiendish eyes on that man. Have you considered, have you weighed that? Have you considered? Now, here's something we did not bring out when we discussed God's opinion of Job. In this passage, he said, my servant, Job. There are a number of people in the Old Testament who called that. Moses. Abraham. My servant, Job. The word was sometimes used as as, as a sign of humility. Uh, When one person would come to another, perhaps of superior knowledge or wealth or position or something, and and, uh, they say, I'm your servant. Yeah, that's not what it means here. Although some of that is there. 
It does mean someone who obeys someone else. Someone who, who renders um, homage to someone else. God is saying of this man, he is my slave, servant. He serves me. He does what I say. Not only does God repeat them, those four things that we talked about from the first verse. There's none like him in all the earth, a perfect, upright man, one that fears God, one that turns from evil. He's my servant. Have you set your eyes on him? And I know you have. And Satan answered the Lord. You talk about slander. You talk about sl- This answer is slanderous. Read what he says. Does Job fear God for nothing? Job is talking about the commercial righteousness bit. Job is what he is because of all you've given him. You've hired him. That's what this means. You've hired him. There is no such thing as disinterested righteousness. So that's what Job would say. There is only that righteousness which comes because you buy it by giving him good things. 3,000 camels, 7,000 sheep, oxen, donkeys, wealth, position. Eventually he comes and says, you put a hedge around him. And Satan himself recognizes the providence of God in this man. But it's that commercial. He is slandering God. They don't, mankind does not love you for who you are, only for what you give them. But he slanders man too. <laughs> he slanders Job. There's no indication that Job has this position before God because he has camels, or donkeys, or oxen. He has a heart that's in God said he's my servant. This is the way he is. So Satan slanders God, and Satan slanders man. Satan slandered God in the Garden of Eden. Hath God really said? (laughs) Have you considered him? There's none like him. My servant, none like him. Perfect, upright, you know what those are. Blameless, straight, fears God, turns from evil. Does he serve you for nothing? You've put a hedge about him. And about his house. Put out your hand now and touch what he has. Remove the goodies. Remove the evidences of providence. And see what he does. He's basically saying, Job is selfish. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Don't put your hand on him. And so Satan went out. And there's the beginning of those terrible things, those Terrible things that happened, which is the adversity in which Job was yet to demonstrate his piety. But, perhaps we have to comment a little bit more here before we move ahead. What about this business? What about this business of God initiating all of this? He brought it out of Satan to say the things that he did. And it became apparent that Satan had already considered Job. 
But then how could it be in the plan of God to allow Satan all that is in all that he has is in your power? How could it be that that would fit the just, holy, good, wise Let me read a proverb. I'm going to read from Proverbs 17. I'm going to find it first. 17.3 The furnace is for silver. The finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. But the Lord tries the hearts. It's an interesting Proverbs. Proverb. It does not say that the furnace or the finding pot is to um, find gold. It really means it's for sorting out. Um, when, I was, when I was a young boy, my parents... Oh, this would have been very... This would be really bad today, I suppose. My parents bought me a um, lead... Soldier set. You could melt the lid and make the lead soldiers. I did. That's what's wrong with me today. <laughs> but, uh, the, the, uh, there was a little teeny, there was a little teeny um, melting pot there that you plugged in and you put lead in it. But after a while, I ran out of the lead that they sold to do that. And I just picked up lid any place I could find it. And, and what would happen? What would happen when you he- heated that weird lid that you picked up here from a sheath of that or something? You'd get a whole bunch of slag on the top. You'd just get scum. And, and that clear molten lead, the stuff that kills people. <laughs> but that, that would be at the bottom. And you'd have to scrape off that stuff. It... it that heat divided the no good from the good. And then when you got down to the good, clear, shiny, melting, molten lead, you, you, you poured it into these, into these uh, forms that you put together like this, and you poured it in there, and, and when they cooled, you come out, and there were lead soldiers, and you were supposed to paint them. I usually had to remelt them and start over again. I never did a good job on the painting, but the slag was the point. You got rid of the junk and kept that good stuff. The purpose, the purpose of this proverb, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, is not to consume this stuff, but to eliminate all the dross and to prove what really is the good and the solid and the useful. Why would God? In this first passage, this first chapter of Job, why would he um, ask Satan, have you considered? Listen to that terrible slander on the part of Satan and then say he's yours to deal with except for touching his body. The scriptures are replete with the fact that God does test hearts. Not for the purpose of destroying but for the purpose of demonstrating what's really there, the solid, the good. It's true in our lives. And in this portion, he's desirous of showing the true character of Job. And he chooses to do it in this fashion. Have you considered him? Yes, would be the answer to that. He's my servant. He is in this fashion. He gives the four descriptions. And then says Satan, yeah, but. And the net result of that is that list of catastrophic things in the last part of the chapter, which involves some pretty interesting things. There, were, there was a reference to the fact that some Sabaeans fell upon uh, those animals and those people who were caring for them. And they killed all the servants at the edge of the sword and 
I'm the only one left to tell you about it. Sabaeans, oh, people are critical about that. There were a group of people who lived in the south western part. Well, they lived in two different sections of, of, of Arabia at the time. And there were two different groups. And one of them was very, very commercial. And the others were Bedouins of the kind who were always harassing other people. But the truth of the matter was, even those who were given to commerce had that mean streak in them, and, and uh, they existed. They were a real people. And they were, they were predatory. It is unusual that they... However, how come they were in <clears throat> the right place at the right time? Or the Chaldeans who, who came a little bit later in this story or in that same portion. And, and, the, and the Chaldeans were a people, the critics would say, oh, the Chaldeans came into prominence much later. But that doesn't hold any water because uh, Chaldeans were associated with the north in Ur, the Chaldees, and that sort of They were around too. And they too had that Bedouin history before they became a great nation. So they too were predators. And how come they were in the right place at the right time or the wrong time? Uh, two observations. Do you remember when our Lord faced the enemy in that temptation in the desert and in and on in these other places the, 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 where, where Satan took him and the Spirit of God was in all of this? And Satan said, look! And he showed all the, all the kingdoms. I don't think this was just a geographic uh, concept. I, it wasn't as though he was standing on a tall building with binoculars. I want you to look around and see. See that? See over there? That's where so-and-so is. Well, and, and then, oh, over here. I think there was more to it than that. Put in the kingdoms is what it says. God had entrusted... I don't like that word. God had allowed Satan to become the God of this age. And the kingdoms of the world he had some control over. And he suggested to the Lord Jesus that he could give him those kingdoms without the cross. Without the plan of God. And the Lord Jesus never, never denied the fact that Satan had the control of those. He did. He had the control. Uh, the question is, how come the Savians and the Chaldeans were where they were and could wreak this havoc on Job? One of the reasons would be that Satan, as the god of the age, and that age would be included, that he had some control over those people. There's another. Satan's, Satan's work still is responsible to God. He has given a certain... <laughs> it's like, give him so much rope. And he did. Satan had authority. But God has also told us that he's the God, in the book of Acts, who has placed this and that and the kingdoms and the king. And you remember Habakkuk? No, oh, he complained. How long am I going to cry for what's happening here among the people? Terrible thing. Lord, hear me. And God answered, I'm already doing something about that. Well, Lord, how about I? I'm going to send the Chaldeans. Ooh, not the Chaldeans, Lord. They're worse than we are. It's a good book. Got to read that. God does control those things. How come those people were where they were? Those Bedouins, those predators? In God's plan, they were His instruments. He who uses the wrath of man to serve, they were His instruments. That's a terrible portion, really. They made off with the camels. Made off, they killed the, some of the animals. They killed the servants. And that's why we need to also come back to that verse that says, or we read this verse on another occasion, come back to, to Job's reaction to all of this. 
And, and God brought this out. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. And it doesn't stop there. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job didn't sin or charge God foolishly. He did not shake his face. Shake his face. Shake his fist in the face of God. Didn't do that. If you're a God of love, what? You are a God of love. If you're just, why? No, it didn't say that. He is just. If you're wise, why? didn't say that. God is wise. And we don't understand all of those things. All of the ins and outs and the innuendo of all this. No, no, don't pretend to. We do understand what Scripture said. God asked the question, have you considered? And he knew he had. He brought that out. Yes, I have, but I accuse him. I accuse him of being righteous because he's received something from you. And basically he's saying, I have accused you, God, of hiring men to love you. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Job had been put into the crucible. And what came out was pure godliness. Have you considered him? Mm-hmm. But he only serves you because you've paid him. Not true. St. Job knew absolutely nothing about that. You know far more about the Job story than Job knew. He didn't know that God had spoken to Satan. He had none of that background. And still he came out exactly as a godly man should come out. You and I are blessed and helped enormously by the story, history, in that we understand there is an enemy. We understand the enemy has access to the Father to accuse us. We understand that he's the God of the age, though it's not mentioned in this, it's, it's still the truth. And, and he has control over things, we understand that. But we understand it is possible to live a godly life in adversity. Anticipating in extremity. He lost everything he had in that chapter. You remember we talked about the fact that he lost the allegiance of his wife for a while. You speak as one of the foolish women. And then a little later, you find him scraping himself. <laughs> With what has been described as the disease of all diseases. No one is sure what it was. And still, he's a godly man. 
So what does that tell us? How, how does the medicine work? I'm not sure I know how it works, but I know what it is. It is to fear God. It is to turn from evil. It's to serve Him. It's to recognize His sovereignty. It's to recognize His wisdom. It's to recognize His love. And He does not make mistakes. This is a great portion for where we are today. And the good that He is, and the good that He does, I take because He said so. Not because I feel good about it. Feeling. It's knowing. I live with feelings. You know I do. But I know, I know what God has said. He's told me His Word. And I know how I am to live and to walk in the light of what He said. (laughs) Poor Job. He didn't have the book. Very limited very limited revelation to him. I don't know what it was or where it came from, but I have the book. It tells me about my God. It tells me what he expects of me. I'm included in that plan that he's worked. That plan that he's designed from all eternity. I'm included in that. Piety and prosperity. Money in the bank. Good. Piety in adversity. And in extremity. Better. Better. Job wasn't hired. He was a willing, compliant servant. God help us. God help us. We have not dealt in detail with all of those terrible things that happened. We will refer to them once more, probably next week. You've read them. He was reduced to zilch. Zero. Nada. (laughs) And still testified to the fact of who his God was and what his God meant. Friend, how important is it that we get those truths of who he is and how he works before we meet the pressures of whatever risk life brings us. Oh, it's never too late. That's true. But what a consolation to lean on those truths, to stand on those truths. And then comes this, and then comes that, and and, and they shake us, and they, they... But there we are. Learn that these good from the book. Learn that he's wise from the book. Learn that he's sovereign from the book.
Not from the newspapers. Or from the accidents. Or from the illnesses. Father in heaven, help us to read carefully thy word. To listen to the Spirit of God as He teaches us from the book. And to have that medicine readily available at all times. To have that resource Help us to love Thee more. Not just because You do good things for us. Oh, we're grateful for those. But because of who You are. And help us to live every single day in the light of who You are. Yes, and who we are. To know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we're called children of God. Why shouldn't we love our Father? Help us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.